My name is Andrew Stotz, and I'll be your host as we continue our journey into the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with David P. Langford, who has devoted his life to applying Dr. Deming's philosophy to education, and he offers us his practical advice for implementation. Today's topic is Taguchi Loss Function. David, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I liked how your eyes got really big when you said Taguchi Loss Function, like, oh my <laughs> gosh, you know, it sounds, sounds frightening, doesn't it? It does. It's a little bit overwhelming. It's exciting. I'm, I'm interested to learn. And uh, in education, it's probably less known than it is in business. Usually, if I'm working with a group of business leaders, and I mentioned that, I can get pretty strong. Two-thirds of the audience probably knows something about the Taguchi loss function. Uh, <clears throat> I was at a conference with a whole room full of school superintendents, and I asked them, anybody know what the Taguchi loss function was? And not a single hand went up. So uh, less, less well-known, but just as applicable. So in one of the earlier podcasts, we were talking about the concept of optimization of a system. And I just want to refresh the, our memories and the memory of our listeners that uh, it's really based on Deming's system of profound knowledge as well. So um, the four parts that Deming had was, it was uh, appreciation for a system, understanding variation, and especially statistical variation, psychology, and knowledge of theory. And I always add neuroscience to that mix as part of uh, profound knowledge because it's really critical to understand, especially in education, how the brain actually processes information. So when we're talking about the optimization of a system, we're actually talking about all of those factors <laughs> being optimized especially in a classroom or a school. So you can't just, uh, you know, sort of optimize one thing. For instance, so over the last 30 years, I've known principals that are just really, really good managers, excellent at running the building. Uh, they, they never do anything out of the ordinary. Everything is always perfect. The trash cans are always where they're supposed to be. They, uh, you know, they're just really good managers. Uh, they're the kind of people that if you're going to take a school trip and they have to organize uh, something complex, uh, that's, that's the kind of people you want. Mm. But if you're going to do something really super innovative, change the system in some way, do something that's never been done before, uh, that's not <laughs> the kind of person that you want. Well, it's, so, it's interesting that you yeah. just mentioned that optimizing so many different factors, that's part of the reason why people don't, you know, don't do it because it is complex. Um, you know, David, I just pulled up um, Wikipedia and I thought maybe it would be interesting if we see what Dick Wikipedia says about what is the Taguchi loss function. Would you like me to read a little bit of that? Yeah, so I, go ahead. The, to the, according to Wikipedia, the Taguchi loss function is graphical depiction of loss developed by the Japanese business statistician Genichi Taguchi to describe a phenomena affecting the value of products produced by a company. Praised by Dr. W. Edwards Deming, it made clear the concept that quality does not some suddenly plummet when, for instance, a machinist exceeds a rigid blueprint tolerance. Instead, loss in value progressively increases as variation increases from the intended condition. This was considered a breakthrough in describing quality and help fuel the continuous improvement movement. So now that we've lost about 80% of our audience. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> no, that's uh, it, it's actually correct. And Taguchi was actually a contemporary of, of Deming and Deming always referred to Taguchi as having one of the best, the greatest breakthroughs in systems. But I really want to focus on in education and applying this kind of thinking to education and, and what would that mean? So um, I think we looked at a, a Taguchi loss function diagram. And if you could pull that up. Yeah, let me pull that screen. up for the, for the video viewers and I'll, I'll walk you through and we'll walk you through for the audio listeners. And, and then we'll put a link in the show notes for the, yep. if you want to contact it later. So 
basically you have to start to think about, <clears throat> and then in the diagram, right in the very middle of the diagram is the target or what Deming would talk about as a, a system that's perfectly op, uh, optimized and in that um, there's not there's not losses on either side. And basically without getting into too much uh, statistics or math or anything like that, the further you move away from that optimum state, the greater the loss. So and maybe, I want to tie, maybe for the yeah. for the listeners, I'll just describe that we're looking at a uh, parabola. So we have uh, on the y-axis we have a, the level of loss. In other words, if it goes down on the y-axis, the loss is going down. And on the x-axis, we have the value of the characteristics, meaning we want to hit some target. And the parabola is going up if you go too far away, so loss is rising if you go too far to the right, or loss is rising if you go too far to the left. So in fact, that's kind of interesting. Both, if you're off target either way, it's still going to bring you loss. So let me, let me give you a very practical uh, education example. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Uh, Doug Stillwell in um, Iowa, when he was a school superintendent, he had, his problem was that uh, parents were complaining when uh, the time that they would get called when there was a snow day or a school cancellation during the winter. And so these complaints just had gone on year after year after year for 20 years. And so finally, when I taught him about the Taguchi loss function, he did a little study with parents to find out the optimum time to be called. And so he sent out surveys and said, <clears throat> you know, what, what would be the optimum time? And if I recall, it ended up the perfect time was like 620 in the morning. Mm. So the further the earlier you did it, as you move towards, say, six o'clock or even earlier, if you went all the way to like 530, then the losses became huge. There's just tons and tons of people did not like that. And on the other side, if 620 was the optimum, the closer and closer that you move towards seven o'clock, there's already people going to work and making other plans and not being informed, et cetera. And so the losses are mounting on that side as well. And so he ended up Im implementing a system that, and explaining parents always, even new parents coming into the system, that you will receive a notification by 620 every morning, uh, whether or not there's gonna be a school closure. And guess what? Uh, complaints virtually disappeared completely. Mm. So I think it's a really good example about, <clears throat> you can optimize even you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's that's not a big deal. And I'll just put up with the complaints. But why would you want to do that? <laughs> you, why would you have want to have parents calling board members and calling the school and complaining about this and that? And, and it goes back to, uh, you know, really making people happy within the system. But you're not just making them happy just for happy's sake. You're making them happy because you're doing a really good job of managing with the input of the people in the system because they're the most knowledgeable about the system. So, so many managers will make a decision like that. It could be based on what's, what's best for the front office. It could be that the decision is, you know, what's best for me as a manager. You know, I don't like to get up before six o'clock in the morning and check the weather and have that to be the first thing I do, do during the day. And so I'm, I'm gonna do it at this time, right? but have no systems knowledge. They haven't taken the time to actually solve the problem or understand what the problem, what, even what the problem is. And that, I, that is where I think Taguchi loss function really comes in. Same, same kind of an example I wanna share would be like in a classroom. If you're talking about the speed at which you're, you're, you're moving through material that you're teaching kids, it's, they're learning about stuff, well, you go too fast, right? You're gonna, gonna the losses are gonna be students who can't keep up, don't understand, get frustrated, get mad, et cetera, right? On the, that's on one side. And on the other side, if you go too slow, you have all the students that really do grasp things, 
things quickly and, and want to move forward. So understanding that optimum uh, zone, um, and, and oftentimes in neuroscience, uh, scientists will sometimes call it the learning zone, that there, there's a zone, a speed that you can go in. But there's another way to optimize learning within the classroom too, and that is as a teacher to stop managing it the pace yourself and let each student learn to manage their own pace. And so now each student is starting to optimize learning uh, based on their pace. Mm. Well, the reason we don't do that is if I've got 30 kids in the class and I got 30 kids at different paces, that that's, that's a lot more work for me as the teacher, right? Rather than me setting the pace and forcing everybody to work within that. So I would have to learn to manage the system much differently <laughs> if I'm going to optimize learning for every child within a classroom or, or think about a whole school uh, that's optimized like that. You know, I was, lots of teachers trained and, and how to manage like that. Yeah. I was thinking about, uh, I, I love some of the quotes from Thomas Sowell in America, and uh, he's a wise man, and he says, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. And in a way, mm -hmm. I feel like the Taguchi loss function is really kind of the Taguchi trade-off function with loss on both sides, you know, whereas a lot of times we think about it, you know, like there's a specification and, you know, that's what we're aiming for. And that's what I think is really inter interesting about the Taguchi loss function is that it makes you aware that either way you go, you're going to have a trade-off. It may, let's say you could speed up a production process in a factory, but it will impact other processes or, you know, that type of thing. So everything is a trade-off. Yeah. It's, and it's exactly the same concept, the same thing in a, in a classroom or a learning system as well. So, and one other question about that is, uh, you know, you mentioned about, uh, optimizing in this case for the parents. Now, you could see that some people, some teachers in a school may say, you know, I don't really care about the parents. I want to optimize for my convenience. And I leave for school at 6 a.m. and I want to know at 6 a.m. if we're going to be closed or not so I don't have to go in. So um, how does that work? Like you've got to decide. Also, you talked about optimizing. You could optimize for each individual student versus optimizing for the group of students at a whole, as a whole. How does someone figure that out when they're in that system? Yeah, so that, that comes back to uh, the constancy of purpose. And that was Deming's number one point out of his 40, 14 points is, do you have a constancy of purpose? And so like for a school, you know, if the, if the constancy of purpose is so that you always have a place to park your car and, uh, you know, you always get out of the building by four o'clock in the afternoon and, you know, whether that's individually or written or unwritten, within the whole school, you are implementing a constancy of purpose. But if your constancy of purpose is to, to continually create learning experiences for youth in its day in order to add value to society, that's, that's a much different purpose. And that means everybody has to be focused on creating those learning experiences and looking at students as, you know, if they were in a company, you'd say they'd be the customers, but they're, they're the clients or they're the people receiving the service and uh, the schools that really get it understand that that's why they exist. Right. They, they exist only for student learning and, and no other purpose. And so everything becomes optimized around that purpose. So. Great. So maybe I'll just summarize some of the things that I, you know, took away from that. I think the first thing is I, I kind of see now to Gucci loss function as it's kind of a trade-off, and we can see that uh, the objective is to identify what are you trying to optimize for, and then understanding that deviating away from that on either side will bring loss, and ultimately what you want to try to do is find the optimum point where that line, that parabola, is having the least loss in relation to what is your constancy of purpose, what is the purpose of what you're doing. Uh, anything else you would add to that? No, that, that, that's exactly right. And I'm sure that, that there are parents that are listening and, and they th say, well, you know, my, my child's gifted in school and, and they really like to move fast. And, and if you sort of optimize the, play, the pace, you know, my child's going to start to be bored. But then there's mu there are other ways to think about that, that if you finish everything uh, very quickly, 
uh, you, you have a lot of options now, right? You could help somebody else. And, uh, you know, is somebody going to bully you, you if you've been helping them on a daily basis, understand a concept or works through something? Um, you could go ahead on your own speed. You could go faster if you want to go on. Or maybe you're not as good in another subject and you need to spend that time uh, optimizing the performance in math or English or something else that, that you're not as good in. And so I used to always teach students that your job is to optimize your own system, right? And my job is to operate this system, optimize this system and the superintendent and so on and so forth, all the way up to a whole mm. nation optimizing performance. So um, I want to just tell a quick story before we wrap up. And that is um, I was teaching a finance course and I knew that my students did not understand finance and they were kind of terrified. And so what I had was I had, I would teach a little bit and then I would give them a practice problem. Then I would teach a little bit more and I'd give them a little practice problem. And what I did, here, here's what I did and tell me what you think of it. So what I did is I basically told the students, I said, stand up when you've calculated the answer. So what happened was after I did the first couple of questions, well, first of all, I like to keep students moving just because I feel like, you know, make, make it a little bit more exciting. So the students would stand up and you could clearly see that there was a group that would stand up first. So what I then did is I said, okay, now after assessing this a couple of times, I was able to see that there was five students in the class that were just knocking it out really fast. I said, okay, now five students come down. It was a big class. It was at a university. And uh, I said, okay, you five students come down to the front of the classroom and line up. So they lined up in a, like a, a line. And then I told the other students, come down and get behind one of these students until we have, let's say, six people in each line. And so the students all came down and they got in lines with the one that they know or whatever. And then once they were done, I said, that's your groups. So the next time that I got, I did the next problem, I had to move around each other. And the next time I had the problem, I said, okay, solve this problem. Whatever team where every member of the team has finished, and you got to make sure everybody's finished, that team stands up first. And then I tried to use the power of the knowledge of the senior people, or not senior, but the, the ones that really got it quickly to help the others. And they were helping the others, just like what you said. Yeah, so uh, what you did is it's a system of profound knowledge again, but from a neuroscience standpoint, yes, you're right. Kid, students of any age have to be up and moving. We need that spinal fluid moving up and down their spine and moving back and forth in order to get blood flow going to the brain and everything. So th that part's really good. Um, what I probably would have adjusted would, I would have said, okay, as soon as you understand this, I want you to stand up and find somebody still sitting down and go explain it to that person and go over it until they understand it. And then now there's two of you that are gonna stand up and you're gonna find somebody else still sitting down. And so you sort of exponentially start everybody in the room and the noise level goes up and the fun level goes up. And then everybody's actually looking for somebody still sitting. Mm. And, uh, uh, and would you do that I've every time, it. every time, let's say you have 20 quiz or uh, 20 test questions that you're giving them throughout a three hour time period, let's say, um, would you do that each time where you would just say, go help whoever's sitting down or would you yep. eventually allow yep. them to get into groups or not? They're going to get, they're going to get faster and faster and faster. Yeah. Again, it yeah. comes back to your constancy of purpose. Do you, ha do you have a constancy of purpose or a meaning about why you want them to get into groups? Are they struggling with group being able to be in a group and communicate in a group and those kinds of, okay, if that's my purpose, that's Which it's different. not because one of the unique things about Thais when I teach here in Thailand is that they're much more uh, comfortable in groups compared to, let's say, Americans. So they don't need group work. But I also see that what you're telling me, uh, that method will accelerate. You know, the, the process won't take as long. I think it would accelerate pretty quickly. So, all right. Well, I would say I learned something from today's lesson and I'm going <laughs> to test it out because my purpose for that class, I had like four. 50 people in the class, many of them were very scared of finance. And I said, I'm going to get all of you to the level of competence that I want. That's my goal. It is, that was my goal in that class. And so that's part of why I did it that well, way. When you're optimizing, what you're saying is correct. You're optimizing because you want every single person to really enjoy and, and, 
you know, I have a joy in learning for finance, right? Yep. So how, how am I going to get there? What's the quickest way I'm going to get there? How am I going to optimize that? So. Yep. Fantastic. Well, David, on behalf of everyone at Deming Institute, I want to thank you again for our discussion. And for listeners, remember to go to Deming.org to continue your journey. This is your host, Andrew Stotts, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming. People are entitled to joy in work. Mm-hmm.